Good morning. It is my honor once again to welcome you all to the 37th annual meeting of Doctors for Disaster Preparedness here in the summer of 2019 when we have many anniversaries to commemorate. It's the 75th anniversary of D-Day, the 70th anniversary of the publication of Orwell's novel 1984, the 50th anniversary of the Apollo landing, and the fifth anniversary of the disappearance of Malaysian Airlines Flight 370. We have a sad event to tell you about. On July the 4th, we lost Bob Gilligland, an American hero and a very good friend of ours. Who This is his, him pictured next to his phenomenal airplane, the SR-71 Blackbird. And you, there's a reference in your handout to publications that he has given at DDP while worth looking at. I'm going to talk about um, as an introduction, some of the things that we have lost and what we are in danger of losing. We lost the SR-71 Blackbird a long time ago. It's only in museums. You may have seen one of them at a, D a DDP meeting. Robert McNamara even destroyed the specifications for building another one. The Lockheed Skunk Works, where these engineers, brilliant engineers, were free to innovate, that's gone. The Saturn V is gone. NASA is uh, worried about not having enough diversity in its astronaut program, but less worried about not having a rocket that will take them anybody anywhere. And we're tearing down memorials to American heroes. We're losing our independence. Whatever field you're in, your ability to act is much constrained. Uh, your freedom, even your freedom of speech, this is hot off the press. Berkeley City is banning man-centric language in its city documents. You can't say man-made and you can't use any third-person singular pronouns. All of us are a they to go with our um, multiple personalities, I guess. Western civilization is threatened and we really are in a big fight. As the prophet Amos said, woe to you who are complacent in Zion. You put off the day of disaster and bring near a reign of terror. I'm sure you're all familiar with Isaiah's words about beating your swords into plowshares, well, the prophet Joel probably deliberately turned his words around. And when there's wickedness to be defeated, and as Chris and Carney told us, there are enemies, you must beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. What Today we are replacing a lot of our independence and freedom or sacrificing it in the name of safety. So a few words about safety in the airline industry. This doesn't always work out that well. As we know, two Boeing um, airliners, brand new ones, crashed five months apart. Hundreds of airplanes were grounded because we're trying to avoid pilot error. But we have this automated flight control system that uh, forced planes into a dive if there was a faulty sensor, and the pilots did not know about the system or how to override it. There's also a system that the pilots cannot override that I know about only because I asked Gordon Claycomb, who used to work at the Skunk Works and who has spoken at our meetings about this article in the July 2019 Atlantic about that Malaysian airliner that just vanished, which is not supposed to happen. Many interesting facts in this. It does not mention the Boeing Honeywell uninterruptible autopilot system that's supposed to prevent hijackings because it can seize control of the airplane from outside. But I guess it could also be a hijacker without being in the uh, cockpit. Anyhow, nobody knows what happened here. The authors in the Atlantic suggested it must have been though, a deranged pilot who decided to commit mass murder and then commit suicide. But not everybody agrees with that. Um, there is a, another book out that I haven't read yet, but the blurb in commentary suggests that maybe Putin did it. But anyway, we don't know. But we're sacrificing freedom and safety and, and uh, freedom in the name of safety. A little bit of history. If you are all getting older like I am, you may have the experience that you remember things, just odd things that happen that are just very important and you can't get out of your mind. I remember my first and only trip to Germany in the early 1980s. I was an aspiring academic. I went to this fancy medical meeting in Hamburg. I do not remember learning anything at that meeting, but I do remember some things from my visit to my German pen pal, high school pen pal, uh, besides the fact that the tune to Jingle Bells is also a German drinking song. <laughs> I got a tour of Münster by her father, who was a retired German history teacher. 
He told me that he was in the Wehrmacht. He was stationed in Finland. He assured me he was not a member of the SS, which was very brutal. But he took me around in Münster. Um, he did not speak any English, so I might have missed a lot, but but he, I do know that we, it, the, what remained of the main railway station, if you stood there at the end of World War II, you would look to the horizon and see not a single building standing. I did not tell him what my daddy was doing during World War II. Um, he was the, the navigator and radio man on one of those B-24 liberators you may have seen. Um, but well, there were many build beautiful buildings in Münster. And I, I heard this one sentence over and over again. Es wurde ein Krieg zerstört und ist wiederhergestellt worden. It was de destroyed in the war and has been restored. Because there are things that you can rebuild. We were looking at some of the artwork and I was admiring the craftsmanship, but he just sort of insisted that I take a look at this picture and understand what was in it and what it was about. So I think this was probably the picture. And if you look at it, you will see there are women in there carrying men on their backs. Well, why was that? It was an event that occurred in 1140 and was still being commemorated by an artist in the 16th century and still remembered today. What happened at the, sie the siege of Weinsberg Castle is that, um, well, the, the besiegers won. And like usual, the conquerors want to kill all the men. But Conrad III decided to spare the women, and he graciously offered them the opportunity to leave the castle grounds with anything that they could carry on their backs. So they carried their men. And I'll bet there's more than one person in here who owes his life to one of these women who may have saved one of his ancestors. Well, they're still remembered today, the Troye Weiber, the loyal, faithful women. The, the castle is still called Weiber Troy. And you may have remembered some of these other women who have saved men. Anybody know who Shifra and Pua were? Uh, these were the Hebrew midwives who refused to carry out Pharaoh's orders for a post-term sex-selective abortion of male um, Jew uh, Hebrew infants. Um, you may remember Michal. She was the woman who saved the life of King David by lowering him down in a basket out of her window when her father, King Saul, was trying to kill him. And you may remember Rahab, who was a, uh, a harlot or prostitute who saved the life of Joshua's spies. Anybody here ever hear of Virginia Hall? Good. This is a wonderful book you ought to read if you're thinking about D-Day. She was supposed to be a wealthy American socialite, but she wanted to fight the Nazis. Although she could speak six languages, the Americans would not give her any job other than typing because she was a woman and because she had a disability, she had shot herself in the foot and got around with a prosthesis that she named Cuthbert. But instead of whining about being discriminated against, she got herself a job in Churchill's Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. Is one of the first people to be infiltrated into France to try to build a French resistance virtually from scratch. If one of your ancestors survived D-Day, it may be because of Virginia Hall and the resistance that she recruited, trained in sabotage, got equipped, and, and so that they were able to slow down the, uh, the Nazi troops. Uh, de Gaulle tried to take credit for it, but you may owe your life to Virginia Hall. Another interesting book I came across recently, um, A Short History of Nearly Everything, is really a history of some of the seminal advances in science and the people who made them. Just looking through the index, and I just picked out a few names that will probably be familiar to you, but what struck me in reading the book is except for Rosalind Franklin and Marie Curie, who were fantastic scientists, all of these people are boys. And they're all a little crazy if you read about their life. I mean, I always thought that boys were crazy. But this guy, Milenkovic, he spent 20 years calculating with a pencil and a slide rule that, uh, uh, factors that he thought might have had effect on changes in the Earth's orbit. Now, you've heard about Milenkovic cycles. Just think what would have happened to any of these boys in an American public school where they do mental health screenings. But probably none of them played well with others, and they were obsessed about doing weird things, like calculating that. 
a little more history, I'd like to think about who won World War II. And I'm not so sure that we, that we really know. After World War II, Germany was in rubble, but we had the German economic miracle, in quotation marks, because some people say, well, it's what you would expect to happen if you, like Ludwig Erhardt, throw out the price controls that Hitler imposed, and then the American occupation after him, and you throw out the, um, the heavy taxation and regulation and the inflation, you get a miracle. Now, instead of the Third Reich, which thankfully is not here, we do have the European Union, which is dominated by Germany, seems to have conquered Britain, and we'll see whether or not Britain can escape, and it's run by technocrats. We'll learn more about that here. And the ideology of the Nazis, and Nazi, of course, is a contraction for national socialism, and their green ideology and their eugenics are being, becoming pervasive in the United States. The roots of the Green New Deal, we, AOC may talk about it, but I believe she has plagiarized it, possibly from the Nazis including Hermann, Hermann Flohn, who was one of the most important climate scientists in the 20th century. He believed that CO2-induced global warming was more dangerous than nuclear energy. And we have imported that idea along with the German rocket scientists. Of course, the, German, the Nazis were very connected with, with nature. And they in, in imposed all these environmental laws, which we are, seem to be imitating. Rudolf Hess loved to talk about sustainable development. This is something that just came up on my Twitter feed from a recent German newspaper that says that in the battle against climate change, that exhortations and free will measures or voluntary measures are just not going to cut it. If we're going to stave off catastrophe, we have to use force. Well, how is it going to turn out? There are other other headlines like Germany without power and the commercial climate change where the German economic miracle is being destroyed. You can ask where are the German men, the fathers, the brothers, the husbands of these women who were afraid to go out even in groups in public because Angela Merkel is importing all of these people with a culture that thinks it's perfectly okay to rape infidel women and if their own women are a victim, well, you just kill her. And there's some irony about global warming. The Nazis may really have believed in that because in the 1930s there were terrible heat waves. It was the time of the Dust Bowl, and they thought it was industrial civilization. But global warming abruptly came to a halt in 1941, just in time to freeze to death most of the Wehrmacht just outside of Moscow. Whether Hitler's rash decision to invade Russia had anything to do with this belief, I don't know. But we'll see. We may be worried about the wrong time of kind of climate catastrophe. We do have a war in our civilization, which is a war on men. If you want to dominate a conquered people, you've got to get rid of the men. And we hear a lot about the good of the whole, and we hear about the herd in many contexts here. Well, we know what farmers have to do to their would-be rams and bulls. Um, slaves were often castrated. Today, our, our current Delilahs or our radical feminists are using somewhat milder measures to try to keep men sh um, quiet or, or keep them out of the picture. A rising thing that I think we really need to worry about is transgenderism. We're having the growth like wildfire of these clinics to treat gender dysphoria and they are sterilizing or chemically castrating boys at a much younger and younger age, eight-year-old boys. And the medical profession is accepting it. Uh, I'd like to close with some words that you can read from a British psychiatrist who goes by the pen name Theodore Dalrymple. He talks about a society of emasculated liars is easy to control. We must fight against these lies. We must not use their terminology, even if it's in a prestigious medical journal. It means something ridiculous like gender assigned at a birth. We need, we need to fight for our civilization. We need to fight for the truth. And we need to save our men.